Hello and welcome. My name is Benjamin Berger and this is a sample lecture from the Geology 6400 Advanced Stratigraphy class that I teach at Utah State University. This is part of a series of lectures that I give uh, within this class on various areas in Utah that are very productive in terms of oil and gas um, exploration. And today's lecture, we're going to be talking about the Paradox Basin, which is located in southeastern Utah. Now, the Paradox Basin is one of the iconic areas of Utah. And the, sort of the center of this basin is actually in Moab, Utah. And this is the Delicate Arch, um, which is one of the sort of iconic features of Utah. And so many of the unique features of Utah's geology, particularly in eastern Utah, um, comes from the fact that it's located within this very large basin called the Paradox Basin. So um, in addition to talking about the oil and, and uh, natural gas um, exploration that's gone on in the Paradox Basin, it's also kind of a neat area to talk a little bit about the geology of this basin and how it's basically reflected in the landscape that we have here in Utah today. Now the Paradox Basin formed during the Pennsylvanian period. This is towards the end of the Paleozoic um, era. Um, it's the second half of the Carboniferous um, period. And during this period of time, the continents were arranged, sort of assembling that supercontinent of Pangaea. And this meant that our globe was basically, um, most of the continents were accumulating on one side, just the configuration. And that also meant that we had this very vast ocean that went wrapped around the entire other side of our globe. This presents some interesting patterns that are gonna, we're going to see reflected in the rocks. Now, North America was kind of glommed onto the top, and it was sort of rotated a little bit. And the equator actually ran through Utah during this time span. And so it was a very hot place in Utah. It was right next to to the equator, and it was on the margin of this very vast ocean. And so during the Pennsylvanian period, Utah was sort of subjected to a very strange, very extreme sort of climate. On one side, we had this very vast ocean, which would produce very large El Nino, La Nina sort of ocean oscillation, which basically would create these monsoonal conditions. So lots and lots of rain, and then it would become extremely dry and then lots of rain, and then extremely dry. So this alterating of the climate. And so this basically is reflected in the rocks that we'll see as we talk about the Paradox Basin during the Pennsylvanian. The end of the Paradox Basin occurred during the Triassic period when we finally had sort of a regression and we enter into uh, Utah was mostly a uh, terrestrial area, well, fluvial river deposits being deposited across Utah. And uh, during the Triassic periods when the Appalachian Mountains and the eastern part of the United States were being uplifted, they used to be right next to the equator when they were being formed. And Pangaea was a fairly large developed continent at the Triassic. And so we have the assembly of the Triassic. And we enter into a phase in the early Jurassic of a very dry climate here in Utah. Now, I'm going to go through the various stratigraphic units that are exposed within the Paradox Basin. And the first unit we're gonna talk about is actually the Paradox Formation itself. The Paradox Formation is not exposed very in very many places in Utah. The best place to go see um, outcrops of the Paradox Formation is in the Owl Creek uh, Dome, um, sort of north of Moab, though there's some other outcrops of it to the south. Now, um, the Paradox Formation is a very unique formation within the Paradox ba Basin because it is full of evaporitic deposits. Um, these include uh, halite salts, it includes andehydrite, as well as gypsum beds within the Paradox Formation. And the Paradox Formation is one of the thickest units that we're going to be seeing um, within the stratigraphic section it goes up to 4,000 feet in thickness, though it varies quite dramatically across uh, the base, and we'll talk more about that. So uh, a salt um, layer is at the very bottom of the sequence of stratigraphic units. On top of the Paradox Formation, we have the Honecker Trail Formation. This formation is a limestone, so it's a carbonate rock, and it's just 
full of marine fossils. We have crinoids, uh, brachiopods, bryozoans. So this represents uh, reef deposits that we see on top of the Paradox Formation, a uh, carbonate rock, a uh, limestone. If you head to the south, um, get into Arizona, the Hanukkah Trail Formation is much thicker when you get kind of on the margins of the Paradox Basin, especially if you head to the south and to the, uh, to the west. And uh, so here's some outcrops of the Hanukkah uh, Trail Formation, much thicker than we actually see in the center of the Paradox Basin. On top of the Hanukkah Trail Formation, we have the Cutler Group. Uh, the United States Geological Survey consider the Cutler as a formation, but many people place it within a group, and then they have a, a number of different subunits of the Cutler group of various uh, formations that you may be familiar with in the Moab area. Today we're just going to talk a little bit about the Cutler group as a separate group. The Cutler group is, rep is represented by fluvial type deposits. Um, it's fairly archosic. Um, one of the great characteristics about the color group is it's a very red color. This red color is probably due to the fact that it was in these um, weird climatic shifts. It was well drained. Um, we have uh, a lot of iron coming in from these arcosic uh, felspars that are coming off of uh, uplift to the north and uh, developing during the sequence. Um, so a kind of a braided river system. On top of the Cutler group, we have the Moenkopi Formation. Um, the Moenkopi Formation is easily recognized because it has these very thin lamina structures that you see in it. And it probably represents uh, tidal facies. And it's broken out into various members. And down in the um, Paradox uh, Basin, we have um, some limestone units. So sometimes you get these uh, carbonate deposits, uh, limestones that are developed, and this includes the Sinbad limestone within the Moenkopi. So kind of near the ocean, some um, carbonate type deposits in here, but some muds and tidal type facies. You get even some nice ripple uh, marks within the Moenkopi. On top of the Moenkopi, we have the Chin Li. The Chin Li is um, a unit of variable thickness. It gets fairly thick as you head down into Arizona. The Chinle is easily recognized because it has these variegated uh, various units of uh, different colors. So the variegated patterns, so you see the reds and the white is banded, mostly mudstones and siltstones. The Chinle is famous for it's the deposit in which the um, Petrified Forest uh, National Monument in Arizona is within the Chinle. And the Chinle also produces many of the early dinosaurs, so a fully terrestrial unit. And the variegated beds represent paleosoils, so we're up onto the, uh, the terrestrial continent during the Chinle time. Now on top of the Chinle, we have the Wingate um, sandstone. This is the first Jurassic unit that we have in our section. And the Wingate is a massive sandstone, uh, quartz aronite, fairly thick, um, probably representing deltaic type facies. On top of the Wingate, we have the Kayanta formation, a fairly small, um, thin formation on top of the Wingate. It's a early Jurassic unit, um, often interpreted as fluvial, so river type deposits that you see, um, usually a little bit thinner bedded with some cross bedding there. On top of the Kayenta, we have the very beautiful and characteristic Navajo sandstone. Um, this is in the early Jurassic. The Navajo sandstone is these wonderful uh, quartz aronite, so it's a sandstone just full of quartz, well-rounded, well-sorted, um, representing Aeolian-type facies, so ancient sand dune deposits that are on top of the sequence in the Jurassic. So let's focus in on some of these Permian Pennsylvanian rocks within the Paradox Basin. So one of the things we can look at is sort of the the different types of units that we find at different places along the Paradox Basin. So if you head to the north, the Cutler Formation becomes the sort of dominant formation that you find during the Pennsylvanian and Permian. And it's mostly these arcosic conglomeratic units that represent braided rivers and alluvial fans that are coming off of an uplift to the north. And so as you head to the north, you get this Cutler Formation that's undivided. If you head to the south, then we get sort of the split out of the various formations I just covered. So we have the Paradox Formation, which is full of evaporitic type um, deposits. 
uh, the Honecker Trail formation on top of that, and then the Cutler Group that sits on top of that, that's now mostly sands, um, siltstones coming across here, um, and finer grained than what we see in the Cutler Formation Undivided. Um, if you head out to the far south, the Paradox Formation itself becomes uh, more of a carbonate unit, a limestone unit, with these bioherms. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Now, this is sort of a regional uh, map of what was happening during the Pennsylvanian, and this is a nice reconstruction of the um, region of Utah, Colorado, um, Arizona, and New Mexico during the Pennsylvanian, a reconstruction of the depositional environments. Now, the first thing to note about this is we have a couple uplifted areas within sort of the small shelf, and these are the ancestral Rockies that were coming up in Colorado during the Pennsylvanian period. So we have um, the biggest uplift we have up here is the Uncompadre Uplift. They extended all the way in southwest Colorado coming up into eastern Utah. North of that there's another uplift. This is um, associated with the Front Range and uh, this is areas of um, the fountain formation that form the uh, Flatirons in around Boulder are deposits coming off of this uplift. Um, down in Manitou Springs we get some of these uh, more marine facies and there's probably inlet coming in between these coming all the way across into um, this basin over here. The other important thing to note about the Paradox Basin, which is that basin there, there's the Paradox Basin, is that it had uh, just sort of um, constrained openings to the ocean. And this meant that occasionally those openings to the ocean would basically uh, seal off. And so this is kind of a very similar system that you see in the Mediterranean um, Sea today where occasionally the um, Gibraltar will block that off and the sea becomes constrained. And when that happens, especially during this time when we're near the equator and there's a lot of sunlight hitting uh, this Paradox Basin, it causes evaporation. And so the P Paradox Basin was an area in which lots of salts, it would occasionally um, have be driven by evaporation, so lots of salts would accumulate into the Paradox Basin. There's another basin we'll talk a little bit about to the north, and this is the Eagle Valley Basin up here. And uh, that's the home to Gypsum, Colorado, where they mine gypsum and some of the salts up there. So you see kind of a, a sister basin to the north. Now, as we head into the Permian, we enter into um, the uplifted areas begin to erode away, and we see sort of these fluvial tidal type um, facies that start to develop uh, with the Cutler Formation coming across. And then as we head into the late Permian, we see some more of these sort of drier Aeolian type facies that come in, and a great regression of that ocean happening. And then we enter into the Triassic, so sometime during the uh, Chinle formation, we see those paleosoils, so we see like a lot of uh, soil development, and we're in a fully terrestrial, so driven by fluvial processes, uh, paleosoil developments, as well as lacustrian type deposits in various areas and lakes and uh, ponds developing in the Chinle formation. And so that's where we get all that petrified wood that forms in the Chinle and the various dinosaurs that were running around during this period of time. And so it, in overall, there's a general sort of regression of the shoreline during this period of time in Utah. Now, we can map out the various uh, uplifted areas. And so the uplifted area here, we have the Uncompadre um, Highlands. And um, we have the Ancestral Front Range up here as sort of the two uh, major uplifted areas. Now, the Uncompadre Highlands is going to be the one we're going to be talking about. And basically, these highlands um, formed a low angle thrust type situation fault that runs across here, setting up the Paradox Basin to form down here. So we're seeing a compressional um, force that's moving in this sort of direction from the southwest to the northeast across uh, the southeast part of Utah. Um, there's actually a lot of uplifts and basins being developed during the Permian and Pennsylvanian time. Um, and there's many um, basins that were developing, especially in West Texas, that are also very important for terms of oil and natural gas, and they're equivalent, they're contemporaneous to the Paradox Basin in Utah. Now this is an isopac map showing the development of these salts 
within the paradox basin on the edge of the Ancapadre uplift. So around the edges of the Ancapadre uplift, we have arcosic, uh, conglomeratic type units that form. Um, sandstones um, as you get a little bit further away. And then in the Paradox Basin proper, you have these very thick sequences of salts and on the margins of that anhydrite. So then as you head to the south, um, you end up getting into these uh, shelf carbonates. So um, down in this region, heading over across the border into Arizona in the Four Corners region, you end up with this uh, carbonate platform that develops to the south. So you can see that there's quite a bit of facies changes across the Paradox Basin. The other thing that's really fascinating about the Paradox Basin is that the salt, which is in the Paradox Formation, um, because it's a salt, it's fairly mobile. And one of the things that it basically produces is with that compressional force that's coming in, it causes the salt to sort of um, accumulate um, or be pushed into these salt anaclines. Um, and this is in the thickest part of the basin when you're at the thickest uh, units, the thickest units of the paradox formation itself where you have all that salt. And so this produces these salt anaclines that come across uh, the Colorado River around where Moab is here, which is this little green dot. And so um, one of the things we'll talk about about the Paradox Basin is that most of the um, petroleum exploration that's been going on in the Paradox Basin is actually in the margins of the basin, so down near uh, Blanding and sort of in the very extreme southeast corner down near Bluff. Um, up in Moab, we then have all of these um, salt dipores, these big, huge salt anaclinal features that are um, basically accumulating there. Now, the other thing to kind of mention is you think about this, um, the setup, and we've talked about the Foreland Basin System. So Foreland Basin System, remember, we have a number of interesting features that develop. The first is that we have a um, sort of force, a pressure that's being applied to the lithosphere. So the lithosphere is going to be flexing, and that flexing is going to produce the deepest part of this basin, which is going to be the four deep. Now in the Paradox Basin, the four deep is going to be where we have the sort of Cutler uh, conglomeratic fans and deltaic systems coming down right into this evaporitic um, deposits of the Paradox Formation where it's the thickest. So we have this inner fingering of these alluvial fans coming out into these marine um, sort of uh, facies, but the, the marine is very, very salty, very um, rich very briny type waters, and so we get a lot of these um, evaporitic deposits being deposited there, and it's very, very thick. Now as you move off of the shelf and you head up into the four bulge, then you head up into carbonate type facies. And in the paradox formation, that is going to be this region where we get these bioherms. And so we move from a evaporitic type um, part of the basin to a more carbonate driven part of the, of the basin when we reach up into the four bulge in the top. Now off into the back bulge, when you get off the back of the, um, the four bulge, when we head even further south, we end up getting these more marine shales and limestones. And these are going to be um, rich in organic carbon. And that's going to be important when we try to look for uh, oil and natural gas in this region. Now this is a geological map of one of these features um, up near Castle Valley, um, sort of north of Moab, um, and uh, showing some of these uh, interesting features we get with the migration of the Paradox Formation, all that salt that's in there. Um, these salts are going to form these diapores, and because salt is so dense, and because it dissolves so readily in water, and the unique properties of salt, it basically is going to act as a kind of like a lubricant. And so it's going to move up through these various um, anaclinal sort of features, and it's going to affect the sedimentation on either side of these dolpores um, as they come up and work into this area. So this is down near Castle Valley, a beautiful area um, just north of Moab. And um, so just to kind of tell you what a salt diapore is, a salt diapore is that thick 
part of the salt that basically accumulates and it starts working its way up to the surface. And the reason for this is that the salt easily uh, dissolves in water. So it acts kind of more like a very viscous type fluid. So it's wanting to move up from the um, subsurface up into um, the higher area. It's being drawn up by the groundwater that's passing through here. The salt also is susceptible to various um, forces that are applied to the lithosphere. So if you have a compressional force, it's going to kind of roll, like kind of like a, a carpet would roll if you push it on either end and sort of rumple up. And because of this, the salt's going to kind of form these anaclinal type features. And this is also going to affect the sedimentation on either side of the salt diapores. Probably the really cool place to go um, in Utah to see actual outcrops of the paradox is the Onion Creek Diapore. This is sort of north of, um, of Moab. And uh, here's an example of some outcrops of the paradox formation. Now, the paradox formation, when you see it in outcrop, outcrop form, one of the things that you um, that strikes me when you see these evaporitic deposits is that they are not bedded. Um, so if you look here, you can see um, in the center these white rocks here. This is the paradox formation. It's evaporitic deposits. And you see there's no bedding. But if you look at the Cutler group, which is sitting on top of it, you can see the various bedding that's in here, the various lineations of the various beds that are there. And the reason that there's no real discernible bedding, though sometimes you can kind of see some, is that this paradox formation evaporitic deposits have moved and been structurally sort of deformed or more like ductally deformed um, as they moved underneath the subsurface and domed up. And this is one of the places where you can go and actually see paradox formation at the surface in Utah. Another place that's kind of interesting and has a great history is the Moab Fault. And this is located right at the entrance to Arches National Park. So here is the highway going down to Moab, and, and here is the um, a visitor center here. And we can see there's a big fault going across here. So these beds over here have fallen down, and uh, these beds are up here. And this is the actually the Navajo up at the top here. And what's happened is basically the, um, the beds have shifted, and this was a fault that existed across through here. And the paradox formation, which was on the base, came up through there. And as it came up through there, it dissolved and dissolved away. And then you had the secondary sort of accommodation space that basically caused these um, slopes of the slope on the far side to slope down and to fall into the paradox formation. And there's a little bit of exposure of the paradox formation there along the highway um, down over on this side. So one of the kind of cool things about the um, paradox formation is these weird salt dipores. So these are some wonderful um, cross sections that have been published based on some seismic work that's been done um, looking at the effect it had on the paradox formation. The thing that strikes me about the paradox formation in these cross sections across these anaclinal features, these salt dipores, is that the paradox um, formation is extremely thick. So it's an extremely thick bed of salts. They're very mobile on the subsurface. And so it tends to push up along these anaclinal areas. And in other areas, it thins out. So it causes areas of, of great rise and also areas of subsidence on either side. So kind of some neat, weird features that result in the Moab area and gives the weird characteristics of the Paradox Basin. So here's some other cross sections of some of these salt diapores that have come up. Um, the Moab Valley, um, Castle Valley, and then the Fisher Valley up to the north. And so you can see how this also affected the sedimentation on either side of these salt diapores. So as soon as that salt was laid down and then there were sediments on top of that in the Cutler group, the salt was becoming very mobile. And so that actually affected the sedimentation rates um, of these various units. So you can see the Cutler group here um, being affected where it's much thicker on the margins of these salt diapores than when you don't have, when you're sort of above one of these areas where it's a, a little bit thinner. And so this is because there's almost this additional accommodation space. And so you see pinch outs of the cutler around these salt dipores, which is kind of a neat feature of um, the salt dipores around uh, the Paradox Basin. So here's another uh, cross section looking across. The, this is the Castle Valley. If you go into the Castle Valley, 
and uh, wander around in here, you actually don't see very many outcrops of the Paradox Peak. You see a little dot of the Paradox in the middle of the Castle Valley uh, exposed there. Um, if you go up to the Onion Creek Salt Dipore, there's some of the Paradox formation exposed. But most of that gets dissolved away when it reaches the surface. So here's a cross section of the Onion Creek uh, Dipore uh, north of Moab, right smack dab in the middle of the Paradox Basin. And you can see how incredible um, there was this big uplift of the Paradox Formation, all these salts coming up forming the salt dipore. And this is actually an um, a aerial view of the Onion Creek Salt um, Dipore. You can see the Paradox Formation coming up through here, swelling up, and you can see the effect this had on the Cutler Group that's just overlying it. And this is really nice. You can see these unconformities that are coming off the top because this was an uplifted area right here, even during the sedimentation of the Cutler group. So even during the uh, Permian period here, um, this was not receiving as much sedimentation as this area over here um, as that salt was being pushed up. And you can see here we have the, the Cutler group going all the way up, the Moan, Kopi, the Chinle, Wingate, and Kayenta formations, some of the Jurassic units off in the distance there. Now, one of the kind of neat things about the Paradox Basin is that if you look at gravity anomalies, now gravity anomalies basically are telling you the, um, or detecting differences in the gravity across the surface of the Earth. And this is caused by when you have a more dense rock that's underneath you, um, there's going to be a gravity anomaly because there's more gravity pulling you down. So in these when you're up on these um, anaclinal salt features in the subsurface that you don't even see there, um, you'll see these um, gravity anomalies that are here in red, and that is because the salt is much denser type material than the surrounding sedimentary rocks. And so you get these wonderful um, illustrations of where the salt has accumulated, or I should say sort of accumulated in the subsurface and uh, flown into these areas. And oftentimes these form valleys when they rupture up into the surface and then the salt, of course, dissolves and uh, is eroded away. So kind of neat that you can use gravity anomalies to see some of these salt dipores here in Utah, which is kind of a neat uh, thing to think about. Now, we're going to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about where in the Paradox Basin you find oil and gas. And the the units that we've been really talking about and focusing on around Moab, um, there's no real good source rocks for the um, any sort of oil or natural gas to develop. But as you head to the south, you end up into a number of oil fields right in the sort of southeast corner of Utah, um, right kind of out near Blanding in those areas. And it's this part of the Paradox Basin that has much of the oil and natural gas of the region. Now, all that natural gas and oil is actually coming from the Paradox Formation itself. So the pr production um, about 5,000 feet below surface is mostly in the Paradox Formation itself, so below the Cutler Formation and above some of the uh, underlying Mississippi rocks below. There's lots of little fields um, in this corner of the state of Utah and um, quite a few little areas that people have uh, drilled down to. But there's one big area, and that's the Greater Anath um, area, which is right here, this big area down here. And we'll kind of focus in on that uh, region, that various play. So the um, Anath is split up into four different um, units. You have the, the Anath unit to the north, the McElmo Creek unit off to the uh, east, the Rutherford unit to the west, and to the very south, the White Mesa unit. Um, this was oil that was discovered in 1956, and what makes it interesting to us is that it's a stratigraphic trap. So it's not a structural trap. Composes, what's trapping this oil and natural gas is actually caused by the unique stratigraphy. And for us who've been learning sequence strat, it'll be an interesting way to apply our knowledge to this area. When it was drilled in the 1950s, it reached its peak production in 1959 with over 100,000 barrels per day of oil produced in this, uh, this field. In the 1960s, they started water um, flood into the reservoirs. Um, in the mid-1980s, they began using CO2 gas injection to help uh, 
increase production. Now I mentioned that it is a stratigraphic trap. So what's happening here is we can look for the three things that we want to look for when we talk about oil and natural gas explanation. We need a source, so we need to find the source of the oil. We need to find the um, reservoir rock that's going to hold the oil that's going to migrate into. And we're going to need to find a, um, the trap, what's going to define the trap to prevent that oil and natural gas to reaching the surface and escaping. So in this case, um, we have some black organic rich shales that are up in this region of the basin. So it's kind of on the margins of the basin, right off the shelf and in this foreland basin system. So this is along the back bulge, remember? And so we're having these uh, more organic um, facies that have developed. And then we have these anhydrite facies that come in, these evaporitic facies. Now, anhydrite prevents, has very low permeability, very low porosity, and prevents any migration of oil and natural gas. And then in between here, we have some of these oolitic carbonate carbonate rocks, these limestone type units that have high porosity, high permeability, and those are going to be serving as our reservoir rock in this oil and gas field. Now, this is a cross section across the Mick Elmo Creek in the Aneth field, and uh, this looks like one of our exercises we've been doing in class. So this is a sequence stratigraphic interpretation of a number of well uh, logs that you can see. And you, you can kind of pick out a couple of the fixtures. We have a couple maximum flooding surfaces. Um, we have some onlapping that you can see occurring down at the bottom. And so this is a way in which this reservoir has been compartmentalized um, with the source, the reservoir, and the traps they're developing. Um, and this is driven by, of course, base level changes, sea level changes. So which facies you have at which time is going to be driven by the change in sea level. So this is an isopac map here. Again, the uh, Paradox Basin this is an isopac map of all of the rocks um, in the Four Corners regions. And you can really see how thick the Paradox Basin is as you move um, northward. And then you reach the Encapadre um, uplift and it's, there's no, uh, there's no uh, except there because it was all being eroded down and we have the arcosic built on the edge there and then we get into our salt facies but down here on the margins of the basin is where we have the inner fingering of the um, deeper parts of the basin with the shallower parts of the basin the carbonate platform and this is a wonderful uh, um, cross-section kind of looking at um, some different areas these are some um, showing the paradox salt, the paradox formation. So up to the north, it's extremely thick. And most of this is all that wonderful salt. You can see that on, registering on this well log here. And then as you head up into the Aneth area, you have that inner fingering of the salt coming in. And then out to the south in Arizona, we have these carbonate facies that are over here. And so in the paradox formation, there's this inner fingering of these different facies. And the inner fingering is going to be driven by the changes in sea level. So this is just kind of a general cross section going all the way across Utah. Kind of show us a little bit. So here we have the paradox formation coming here. Here over near Moab, we have this salt diapers. But as we switch out onto the margins of the basin, head toward the um, west, we get a pinch out of the paradox formation that's there. And then the San Rafael swell, which is um, sort of south of Price, Utah, it was probably a later structural feature of the Laramide orogeny that occurred in the late part of the Cretaceous. Now, one of the things we haven't yet talked about in class, and we're going to be talking about later on this semester, is um, how carbonate rock basically um, functions in terms of our sequence stratigraphic models that we've been developing. Now, carbonate rock, remember, it needs to be up in the photic zone. It needs to be up near where it can get sunlight, and that's where you're going to get a lot of the uh, organic material, the coral reefs that are going to be developing this during this time. So we can think about what happens during changes in sea level in a carbonate system. So in this case, we have um, a low, so pretty low sea level. And at this case, we have some uh, reefs and shoals that are up near the coastline. And then behind that, we have some tidal zones that might get wet when we have various tides. And there might be a little bit of an uplift there. But for the most part, this is going to be kind of dominated by some fluvial tidal sort of interfaces. 
But as we get out of um, this very slow transgression, as long as it's very slow, um, this transgression, it's going to support that carbonate platform where the coral is going to grow and all these things like bryozoans and uh, crinoids and things like that that's going to support that carbonate um, shelf. They're going to want to be up in that photic zone and so they're going to build up a mound. Now on the back side of that mound, and this is going to be also um, similar to what we see in the Foreland Basin system, on the back side of that we're going to have this very shallow um, subtidal zone, the kind of lagoonal, be quiet waters. I'm talking about warm waters, quiet waters, a lot of photosynthesis going on, a lot of organic matter being produced. And that organic matter is going to then fall out and get buried. And that's going to be our source rock. So we have this wonderful system that develops. Now if we drove up that um, base level change and cause a big huge transgression and really cover up that area, we can then trap off or cover up that carbonate shelf and throw in some of these very saline um, um, waters that come in and then as they evaporate they form this andehydrate layer and that's going to seal off that uh, that unit and that's going to provide our petroleum seal to prevent the oil and natural gas from going up and escaping. So this is a great sort of concluding uh, cross-section of the paradox system. So up near in within the paradox evaporitic sort of basin up here we have these thick salt units. This is up near Moab. Much of that salt has formed these big salt dipores. But where we find the oil and natural gas is to the south in the very far southeast corner of Utah where we have this inner fingering of the salt coming in, the antihydrate coming in, the axes are seal. We have these marine facies on the back side that are forming the source for the um, oil and natural gas. And then we have the reservoir rock, which is the carbonate rock, which is the shelf, the um, reefs and uh, carbonate shelf that's forming um, that has high porosity, high permeability, and so it soaks up a lot of that natural gas and oil in those areas. Now you may be asking how much oil and natural gas has been discovered from this field in the Paradox Basin. Well numbers are um, that have been published are about 1.5 billion barrels of oil that have been recovered from this basin. The biggest um, production of course was when it was first discovered in the 1950s where it's averaging about 100,000 barrels of oil a day. Um, they began of course doing water injection to increase that production over time as it was dropping off. Um, and then in the mid-1980s they started injecting carbon dioxide to help with production and began doing horizontal drilling in the 1980s. Um, in 1994 they started doing horizontal drilling. That spiked up the uh, natural gas. So today the natural gas coming out of uh, this field is uh, quite a bit greater than the oil. The oil's tapered off to point out in this graph, this is a logarithmic scale. So this is going from 100,000, which is the peak production, down to 10,000, which is what it is today. So it's dropping off, but you can see that you know with a lot of these efforts of, of CO2 injection that's going on in, in the uh, basin, that they're able to kind of keep that uh, production up, um, and you don't see a really big drop off in the last five years or so, which is which is pretty pretty incredible. Um, still doing water injection, still doing um, a lot of CO2 injection, and of course horizontal drilling, and that's producing some of the natural gas that we're still getting out of the system. So you can see the rise in the natural gas, which is this red layer here, uh, coming up to about 50,000 um, cubic feet per day. All right, so that concludes our uh, lecture on the Paradox Basin, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you next time in the next lecture. Take care. Bye.